to the final day of the Defending Early Years 2020 um, Summer Virtual Institute. My name is Denisha Jones, and I am co-director of Defending the Early Years and the lead facilitator of the Institute. And many of you have been with us for the past three days, and a couple might be new, so I'm going to give you a kind of truncated um, overview of Defending the Early Years so that we can get started. Defending the Early Years was founded by Diane Levin and Nancy Carlton Page. Um, as a nonprofit organization working for just equitable and quality early childhood education. I, along with Lake Lundy, have to be co directors. Um, we have an advisory board, marketing folks, and treasurer who you also hear from today. When asked what is the thing that we do in our efforts to uh, protect early childhood and to um, demand that all children have the best early childhood education, we create resources, provide support, and we organize early childhood teachers uh, with some of the habits that we work with. We invite you to go to our website at dey.org and take a look at our publications and our materials, which a lot of people who found very helpful um, in advocating for what we know is best for young children. So this year, the Summer Institute came out of my desire to bring together teachers to, um, to collaborate together and build an advocacy platform that would meet our needs. We realized that a lot of the advocacy happening at the national and state level did not necessarily align with some of our values or did not necessarily address some of the issues that we wanted to focus on. And so when that's what I wanted to do in my new role for organization, I said, let's bring together um, some early childhood teachers and directors and parents and advocates to, to work on building an ECE um, for advocacy. We met last year in the summer at the uh, Eaton Hotel in Washington, D.C. as a small and mighty group, and we engaged in a lot of strategies to think about how we can build this coalition. This year, um, we had to read our plan as the impact of COVID-19 happened across the world, and we are now bringing you a virtual institute where we continue to look at the way to protect childhood and to advocate for child education through the lens of COVID-19, just racial trauma and other issues that young children and families are experiencing. So we had a three days of amazing panel speaking about um, a host of issues that are affecting us, lessons learned from the COVID-19, how schools, children, and family, school teachers and families can serve as protective factors against childhood trauma and traffic stress. Yesterday, we talked about reimagining advocacy. How do we move forward to protect public education and early childhood education um, now that we know that the country is looking to cut uh, budgets and really put teachers and parents into an unfair situation? So today, we wanted to focus on an area that's really important to me, which is play. Um, and really, we had three panels, and we came back and said, no, we need a fourth panel. We need to talk about play because I believe that early childhood education is going to be saved when we really ignite a global play revolution. I've been fortunate in seeing the earlier to support it, my, my work around play, my blogs, my research, and just my activism around play. I was introduced to the Army Play Fellowship for my friends in Oxford, and then I joined this group of amazing early childhood play advocates around the country. I realized that we do have the potential to really ignite this global play revolution. I also uh, got to meet my friend Keisha Reed and her group Play Empower. I see there are so many early childhood teachers who believe the power of play as the best way that children learn and engage and develop. And so today, we really want to bring to you a mini panel to speak about play as we think about how do we move forward in the era of COVID-19. So to get started, we want to invite our co-founder, Diane Levin, to really talk of, to really share her vision of why this idea of protecting play was so instrumental in the founding of Defending the Early Years. As I mentioned, Diane and Nancy are our co-founders, and they've been doing this work in early childhood education for a very long time. And they, they recognized early on what was happening in public education and why we needed to, we needed to change, we needed to fix things. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Denisha, for your intro. And thank you to my colleagues for being here to talk about this issue we all care so much about, play. And play has probably never been more important to talk about than in these times. It was one of the key reasons why we wanted to found Defending the Early Years 
as we found early childhood education becoming more and more and more teaching of basic skills and rote way, pretty rote ways at younger and younger ages, Nancy and I, who had worked together for many years, Nancy Carlson Page and I, were really concerned and started hearing from the teachers we worked with and our former students who had been our, who are now teachers that they were having a terrible time in terms of all the pressure that was being put on them to, to, to cut out play. You know, one teacher said, well, I have 10 minutes after lunch for play for my all day kindergarten. And the principal sneaks in to check to see how I'm doing. And if I sneak play in, you know, I get in trouble. So that was how it was, you know, quite a while ago, but we've gotten a little better in many places and there's more and more advocacy, but we were just, Nancy and I both um, were hearing our former students from Wheelock College and Leslie um, Ben College, you know, being so concerned about what was going on. So we decided to found Defending the Early Years to help create a voice to advocate for appropriate early childhood education that focused on play, its value, and um, how it contributed to the foundations for later more academic learning. I have been teaching such a course at Wheelock, now Wheelock Boston University for, for 20 years at that point to graduate students, undergraduate students, child life students, social workers that looked at therapeutic and academic learning aspects of play and we were really concerned, but at the same time, I was doing from my own research more and more work to see how media and children starting at younger and young ages and spending more and more time with media were spending less time playing. And they had more and more toys linked to the media they were seeing. So the mo suddenly the popular best-selling toys, and I had gone to the toy fair before, so I saw the change. Suddenly the best-selling toys almost all were linked to media and technology and there were many 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 toys for each line that replicated everything children saw on the screen and teachers started describing um, my favorite example was a teacher described putting out play-doh in her pre-k um, she put it on a table near the beginning of the school year right near the beginning so children could come over and make that one of their choices to play and a child went over sat down poked it pushed his finger in and said what does it do? And she said it was like he was pushing buttons on a screen and he was a child who really spent almost all of his time, that was an extreme. But there were more and more children who, more and more of the dramatic play was imitating characters from screens, especially for boys. But when girls played, um, say in housekeeping, what they, you know, what they wanna do is dress up um, and get married and do things like that. So they, you know, and look pretty and look in the mirror and say, am I pretty? And go around and ask others, what could I do to be more pretty? So that all of that led to, um, you know, our concern about screens, but the fact that more and more parents and teachers were saying, my child goes to school and hates it at age four and doesn't want to go. And I have struggles getting my child to go and it was because they would sit down and have rote teaching most of the time and sit maybe 15 minutes on the playground if they were lucky. Um, so Nancy and I founded Defending the Early Years to create materials to help parents and teachers understand and advocate for appropriate early childhood um, education that incorporated meaningful rich play into the process it used materials from the group I had started years before to deal with this issue that specifically focused only on play called Truce, Teachers Resisting Unhealthy Children's Entertainment, truceteachers.org. You'll find the website listed um, in the materials for this, but Truce prepared materials that teachers could give parents, that parents could use, and we prepare guides all the time um, especially at, at the December holidays to, you know, when people were buying lots of toys for children. Blakely Bundy, who's now the co-director of DEY, was one of the founders of Truce because she understood the issues and that's why it's so thrilling to have her now join DEY as someone who understands play so deeply. So with that in mind, I'm really looking forward today to working with my distinguished colleagues who you, I'm not going to introduce them because you're going to hear more about them from Denisha, but we're thrilled they could join us and we're thrilled you can be here to appreciate all they have to share. So thank you very much.
Anisha. Thank you so much, Diane. I've, I've moved around. I hope my sound is a little bit better. Okay. I, yeah, I changed location. I got some headphones. So thank you for that wonderful opening. I really appreciate it. It's so great. And we invite you to come back at the end for our Q&A. So if you have a question for Diane or for any of our panelists, please use the Q&A function um, and put your question in there and someone will be collecting those and reviewing those. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Before we get into our panel, I did want to get to know a little bit about who's in the room, the virtual room. So we have a poll that's going to come up on your screen right now, um, and it's asking how long you've been in the field of early childhood education or education in general. Um, so you can click a response and we'll give it a few minutes, about a minute or so, and then we'll see um, what the response is and kind of get a sense of where everyone, how long we've been doing this work. Oh, wow, but with the polls over right now, and it looks like, wow, this is amazing. 48% of the people here have been in this field for 25 to 30 years. That is absolutely amazing um, that we have so many people. Oh, we have one 39 years and 30 plus years. I should have added another one that said 30 plus, um, so thank you. Um, but that's amazing that we just had so many people who've been committed to early childhood um, for the long haul, and I that one day I can say the same. So we're going to get started with our first panelist today. Peter Gray is a research professor at Boston College. I will never forget the first time I came across his book, Free to Learn. It really just, it impacted me deeply. I, I read it and I just was amazed by it. And um, I brought in as much of his work into my classrooms with my students, um, then my pre-service teachers, um, talking about play deficit and nature deficit, and really talking about how play was evolutionary. That's what struck me more than anything, right? This idea that all species play um, and not just young children. So I'm really excited to have Peter join us today and to be our first panelist. So welcome, Peter. And I was hoping, and again, Karen, you're welcome to talk about anything, because we would listen to you for 10 minutes discuss anything, but I was hoping you could talk about how play might support the body in response to trauma and toxic stress, which we know some children are experiencing greater than others, um, and some of that is not just coming from COVID-19, right? So um, we're, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Thank you, Denisha. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. So, um, you know, play is empowering to children. That's uh, probably the first thing I would say in terms of why play is so important to children, especially during times of stress. Uh, it's always important to children. This is how children learn. This is how children, you know, I've, in, in another talk, I would be going through the whole definition of play and how every aspect of the definition promotes children's uh, learning and development. But uh, play is empowers. I mean, the, you know, the great uh, Russian uh, developmental psychologist Lev Vygotsky long ago in an essay on the role of play in children's development said that uh, the child is a head taller in play than when the child is not playing. And what, what did he mean by that? So there's really two ways in which um, in which that's true. The first is, you know, in real life, children are small. They're relatively weak. They don't have a lot of power. They're subjected to a lot of other people who have authority over them. They have relatively little choice in what they're doing from moment to moment and day to day. But in play, the child is powerful. In play, the child is making his or her own decisions about what to do. Part of the definition of play is that it's freely chosen and self-directed. So the child chooses to play and the child chooses how to play. In play, the child is in power. So, so play is how children experience power. It's how they learn to deal with power. It's how they learn, how they learn to, uh, to create a plan and then follow through with the plan and show to themselves that they can do it. So that's part of why play is empowering. And then there's another way in which play is empowering. Children play powerful roles, especially when they're feeling a need for power. You know, they, why is it that children like to play superheroes? Why is it that they like to take on magical powers in their play? because this is how they overcome in play the sense of, um, 
the sense of victimization that might occur in their life outside of play. So play is empowering. The other thing that can be said about play, and, and if there are any um, <clears throat> child um, therapists in the audience, um, they would know this better than I. Children who have experienced trauma or who are experiencing stress play at themes relating to that trauma, trauma or that stress. You know, there's a, the extreme of this was described in a book uh, by uh, George Eisen, who was a history professor at the University of Massachusetts. He wrote a book called Children and Play in the Holocaust. And believe it or not, in those worst of all situations, children in Nazi concentration camps, children played. Eisen conducted this research by looking at diaries of people who, of children who were in such camps and of adults who wrote about children by interviewing Holocaust survivors. And how did they play? You know, you might think that they would play to avoid the horrors of what they were at, but no, they played at the horrors. They played at the horrors as a way of grappling with them, as a way of dealing with them. Children, children don't avoid the stresses of their life in play. They play at those stresses and this is how they come to grips with them. This is how they deal with those stresses. There was another to take a much less extreme example, but still a pretty extreme example. There was a situation a fair number of years ago, it was probably more than 20 years ago, in which um, <clears throat> a group of kindergarten children were watching out the window of their kindergarten when they ha unfortunately witnessed a, um, um, a service person fall from, um, from a uh, power, uh, fr from a, a utility pole who was repairing that utility pole, fall, fell to the ground and an ambulance came and they took the man away. And this was kind of a traumatic experience. They had no idea whether the man died or what happened to them. And the teacher recorded and actually wrote an article in an academic journal that for Weeks afterwards, the children played at themes of falling, of dying, of going away to the hospital. You know, we might be tempted to want to shut off that play. Why should they be playing at these terrible themes, right? This is what children do. This is how children deal with stress. We have to allow them to play at the kinds of things that they need to play at in order to come to grips with the stresses and traumas that they've experienced in their life. So I also want to make another point before, <clears throat> before I yield to the next speaker, and that is that clearly this has been a very stressful time for many, many families. I don't want to deny that. And when it's, a, when it's a stress for the parents, it's likely to be a stress for the kids as well. And, you know, we live in a world of extreme economic inequality, and as always the case, you know, those who are less wealthy suffer more when there's a situation like this and their children are suffering more too. So I, I don't want to minimize the effects, the stressful effects of the corona pandemic on um, families and children's experiences. But on the other hand, I want to point out something else that has happened. So um, at the Let Grow organization that Lenore Skenazy and I um, founded a few years ago, we conducted a survey actually of 1,600 families. Uh, these were families, these were not families with little children, these were families with children between the age of eight and 13. It was, uh, it included um, cross-section uh, socioeconomically, it included a uh, reasonable cross-section in terms of race, it included uh, definitely a good cross-section in terms of geographic distribution. The overall results of this were that the children on average, I don't mean, I don't want to minimize the harm that some are experiencing, but on average, the children have been less stressed home than they were before. In response to the question of the parents, were your, are your children more stressed or less stressed now than they were before the school closures? Twice as many said less stressed as said more stressed. The, ch the question to the uh, children was, are you more calm or less calm than you were before the school closures? And again, twice as many said 
more calm, as who said less calm. One of the questions to parents, and this was surprising even to me, was are you experiencing more conflicts or fewer conflicts with your child now that your child is home all the time? 73% said fewer conflicts. The point I wanna make is that school has been very stressful. We can't go back from the pandemic to what we were doing before. School is becoming increasingly stressful, even for the very youngest children. It used to be that school was stressful only when you began to get beyond, beyond into, the, into the later grades. But now because of what we're doing in school, it's stressful even for the youngest children. There was a study a few years ago looking at hair cortisol. Now, cortisol is a stress hormone. When cortisol gets into the hair, that means that you are experiencing stress, severe toxic stress over a period of time. What this study showed, it looked at hair cortisol in little children before they started, for a month before they started kindergarten, and a month after they started kindergarten. A month after they started kindergarten, hair cortisol was much higher than it was before. In other words, kindergarten is turning out to be highly stressful for young children. We can't go back to that. We've got to learn a lesson. We've got to go back. We've got to let this experience of children at home, children away from school, observing children play, observing children's resilience, we've got to go back to something more sane when children go back to school. And so with that, I, I will, um, I will bring this, this presentation to a close. Thank you so much, Peter. That is so important. Um, one of the things we're defending earlier is doing a survey as well, too, that we've sent out to parents and teachers. And, and we're more focusing on how the online schooling um, impacted them and the remote schooling. But we did ask about benefits and we did hear more time to play outside, more time to be with family. Um, the children seem more relaxed. Um, been, the parents are more involved in their learning, sibling bonds, um, the, the siblings were growing stronger, and then we also had the range of absolutely no benefit. This is a nightmare, right? But I think your question is different, right? Because you were asking just not being in school. What are the benefits to that, right? And I think you're getting that kind of response, right? And, and that's really important. So we're going to bring back all the panelists at this time and, and have a, a brief discussion to see if anyone would like to add a follow-up to what Peter just shared. As we're bringing them back, I did notice in the chat some folks are, are definitely adding, so please add your comments there. Yes, go ahead. Is that you, Marcy? Yes, I would like to comment. I thought that was extremely interesting, Peter, about the fact that um, children are more stressed in, in school. So I think that that does tell us something, that we really do need to think about um, what um, what we're doing in schools um, and not um, following child development. And I'm gonna go back to what Peter said, the other Peter said yesterday, um, we know what, what um, um, child development is. In fact, I wrote an article one time with Ed Ziegler and the title was, we know what to do. Why aren't we doing it? And um, I think I'll just leave it at that. Let that kind of percolate for a little bit. Why aren't we doing what we know is good for children? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. I know I, don't let me get started on that. <laughs> but I, I agree, let's just let that percolate, right? Let's just let that percolate for a second. Anyone else want to offer a brief follow-up to what we were just talking about? I think there was so much said there, right? But this idea, I mean, it's a, but yeah, I, I can see why kids would be less stressed, right? Think about how stressing, how stressed school is for young children. I remember when I taught at Howard University, there's a middle school on campus, and um, yeah, I take the bus and all the middle school kids get on the bus. And this lady's like, these kids are so loud. I'm like, if you've been cooped up indoors, not allowed to speak for the past six to eight hours, you would be a little loud too. And they weren't that loud, right? Like they were just talking, right? And I could imagine like, yeah, they, when they come outside, they seem freer, right? They were finally free from the constraints of that building and they were just being more themselves. They were talking to people that they'd been in the same building with and hadn't had a chance to converse with all day, right? And so we don't really think about the impact that that, that schooling has on children. Well, one thing I might add, you know, is partly in response to what's just been said and partly in response to some of the chat that I'm seeing is that 
I think what is stressful is parents who get really concerned that their children are falling behind or schools that think their kids have to be, the kids have to be doing school at home and, and doing the lessons in the same way that they would at school, but doing it online. And that does not work. <laughs> Absolutely does not work. <laughs> And every parent would be well advised to pay no attention to the lessons being sent to them <laughs> from their school. That is, you know, pay attention to your child. This is an opportunity to pay real attention to your child and see how your child is learning and play. Read to your child and see what your child wants to read. See how your child is enjoying helping out around the house and learning to ride a bicycle. What an opportunity this is for real learning to occur. You know, I've for many years been studying children who uh, don't go to school at all. And then at some point they decide to go to school. They're, they're in unschooling and then they go to school. And at whatever grade level they are, their age would put them in, they just go at that grade level. They're not behind. You know, people don't remember the school lessons anyway. <laughs> we get way too hung up with whether children are falling behind by missing some months or even years of school. Absolutely. No, you're so right. We're definitely going to keep addressing this and keep talking about this. But let's head over to our next panelist. Um, Jesse, Cof Jesse Cofino is the CEO of Anji Education Inc. and the chair of the True Play Foundation. I met Jesse when I first went to my first Anji Play Fellowship. Um, as I mentioned, a group of us, I don't know the numbers. Was it 23, 20? I don't know how many are in that fellowship. Yeah, like 26, 27. 26, 27 of us um, signed up to spend two years learning to become what I call an Anji Play ambassador. Like all I do now is talk about Anji Play left and right. Um, and we had our first retreat in California. And then I was fortunate to go to the first two play conference in Anji China, which was just amazing because I got to see it. Uh, you know, I got to see it all in action, right? We had just been talking about it, watching videos, but nothing beat actually being there and, and watching children with that freedom to play and how liberating it was um, for myself and for the children and hearing all of the, the wonderful speakers, Ms. Chang, who has created this kind of this Anji Play philosophy um, in her work of over 16 years working um, in early childhood there. Um, so we're really great to have you, um, Jesse. And I really was hoping that you can help us think about how do you balance the need for play in a time of social distancing? I know you have uh, a daughter at home and a very young infant son, right? But like play is so important and people, Keep, to, to young children and people keep saying, well, you know, I keep seeing these awful pictures of children sitting in a chalk box outside. I, I don't even know how to wrap my head around that, right? That's really, that really makes me sad. And so we're hoping that we can share some insight on how we can manage these two really competing ideas. Sure. And just first, I just really want to thank you, Dr. Denisha Jones, just for the incredible work that you've done in, in creating and leading this four days of really probing and, and thought provoking exchange. And so I'm like really humbled and I'm just honored to be a voice in this important discussion. Um, at the same time, I really wanna thank Defending the Early Years for the heroic, the inspired work you're doing on behalf of children, on behalf of educators and families and communities, really just on behalf of all of us. And I also wanna acknowledge as Peter did the pain and the suffering that so many people are facing right now, children, teachers, families, communities, we're all facing just these seemingly impossible challenges. Systems of oppression are in overdrive and educators uh, and schools are so often called on to respond to the needs of those whose voices are silenced and denied. And so particularly now, we really have to come together with love and empathy and care and the resources we can muster to take care of one another. And we also have to raise our voices in advocacy. And you know, as Denisha said, I'm here because I've spent the last six years working with Ms. Chang Shui Chin, who's a revolutionary educator from Anji County, China. Ms. Chung is known throughout China and really increasingly throughout the world for creating a comprehensive approach to early education at just incredible scale that has put the child's self-determined true play at the center of all of the child's experiences at school. It was a community effort led by Ms. Chung that began from the child up. And this movement she started is now driving national policy to remove academic instruction from early education and the first years of primary school. The vision that Ms. Chung authored over the last 20 years is it's being implement, implemented in every province in China, now only recently backed by the Ministry of Education. But you know, in describing the history of the development of her approach, Anji Play, Ms. Chung describes the challenges of showing a hesitant group of educators and traditionally minded families how a self-directed, self-initiated, self-determined experience of play is the deepest and most complex form of learning. She did this through listening, through sharing, and through systems of reflection. 
But, you know, she also confided in me that her much more diff difficult struggle took place between 1999 and 2006, when she took on the position of uh, administrator of early education for the county. It was during this time that she fought to stop the privatization of public early education in her county. She faced pernicious vested interests who literally threatened her life. During this period, she separated public ECE budgets from primary school administration, created separate legal entities for public ECE programs, brought ECE teacher pay in line with that of primary school teachers. She took out personal loans to repurchase schools in the public name, and through a series of innovative policies, created 130 fully inclusive public early childhood programs that provide universal access for the children in her county. When she began this work in 1999, there were only four public early childhood programs and nearly 200 private operators in Anji County. Today, there are only four private operators and all of them practice the Anji Play approach. So Ms. Chung's work and life has been driven by a radical commitment to equity and liberation, whether it's in creating safe school paces, spaces for left behind children, you know, children whose parents had left the county in search of work, leaving these children in the care of their grandparents, or for the children of migrant laborers in Anji, who are so often excluded from public schooling in China, or for neurodiverse children who take part fully in a curriculum that honors their right to be seen and heard with respect and to express autonomy in their discovery of the world and themselves. This commitment is also why our work globally and in the United States, uh, we are focused almost exclusively on community-based programs, Head Start and Early Head Start programs, library programs, and other programs that are focused on providing love and risk and joy and engagement and reflection to children who are most often systematically denied these rights. And I mention this bit of history in our orientation before I share our views about play at this moment, because our support for defending the earliers is not merely an affinity for play, but a deep commitment to a broader mission, a commitment to equity, to freedom from pernicious vested interests of unfettered capitalism, and to the liberation of both teachers, children, and communities from the top-down imposition of systems of exploitation. And I feel really lucky because I'm sharing this virtual stage today with a group of people I believe generally agree that children, young children in particular, will seek to understand the world themselves and others in their own powerful ways. That in this discovery and exploration, children are weighing the relative truth value of a series of propositions. What happens when I stack this here on top of that? What happens when I jump? What is gravity and force and language? And what are the truths of human values and relationships? This crucial need of the child to freely create their own understanding of the world is what we often call play. When children do this without our intervention or interruption, Ms. Chung calls this natural trajectory true play. This true play is also the most natural, most lasting, and most powerful form of learning growth and development for the child and for the adult too. So children play, it's what they do, it's their need and it's their right, it's how children learn with depth and with complexity. And the stories that they tell of those experiences are similarly deep and complex. It forms a foundation of safety for the child, the knowledge and experience that allow the child to face an uncertain and changing world. So I think this question of balancing play in the time of social distancing is an interesting one and, and it involves the adult. When we work with schools, we're talking about ideal arrangements, uh, environments, materials, teacher practices, protocols for reflection, ways in which the adult can be present, observe, record, engage the child in their own reflection and expression, and create an ecosystem where the focus of the adult is on understanding and respecting the child, where the stance is seeing the child and hearing the child and really listening to the child's own story of their own experience without telling our own story about what that experience means or should mean to the child, without an eagerness to scaffold or extend that experience, a system that places love and risk and joy and engagement and reflection at its heart. Um, but now we're talking about children at home, children with parents and caregivers. And you know we talk about ideal arrangements, the things I mentioned above, and these conditions can be created at home with one child, but then we hit the realities realities of childcare and, and work, realities of adults whose primary focus is not on creating systems to support the child's growth, but often just on holding things together. They can't always be present to see and hear their child's experiences. So, you know, in our work with schools, we often talk about balance, how the structure of clearly organized materials, simple expectations and roles and responsibilities allow for an incredible degree of freedom and self-sufficiency and mastery. And often these seemingly contradictory values are interrelated, so, Denise, I heard you on the first day say that you're not making one-size-fits-all recommendations for school reopenings because that would be irresponsible. That wouldn't be feasible. Each place is different, but that no child or teacher should be expected to return to a school that is not safe, and we agree. 
Similarly, we have made the universal recommendation that young children should not socially distance in group settings, but we haven't made any recommendations about the general safety of reopening schools or even regarding children playing in groups at this time. The science just isn't there yet. And so each family and community has to proceed by assessing and balancing their own risks. But children need play and ideally with other children. And they need to share their experiences and to collaborate, have physical co-regulation, to push and struggle with each other. You know, Peter pointed out in a panel that we were on together at the beginning of this pandemic that only other children understand each other's sense of humor. Adults can't provide that. You know, and that really resonated with me. But there is a lot that adult caregivers and parents and guardians can provide. First, children need freedom for, from our adult needs, our emotional needs particularly, our anxieties, their need to take care of our needs. When they have this freedom, they play. If they're playing, they're learning and they're growing. So we need to balance our own needs in relationship to children. We need to step back, we need to let children play. And if we can work to do that, then we're moving towards providing a base level of safety for our children. And so once there are other needs like food and shelter and medicine and protection from violence are met, we can meet this need of social emotional safety. And if we can do that balancing of our own needs, then we can listen and we can provide spaces that allow children to pursue their own interests and ideas at home. We can provide materials and environments that are minimally structured and open-ended. We can provide responsive routines and expectations and roles and responsibilities for children that allow children time and self-direction and fulfillment and contributing to the family. Uh, children have a schedule that respects their needs and that's practical for a family, that's possible. And even if young children can take part in things like doing dishes and cooking, you know, if they're given time and are, and are part of that conversation, children can also play for long stretches of time without our involvement. And so when we take time to listen fully and without interruption to children, when we respond with open-ended clarifying questions during those moments when it's possible by putting down our devices and our agendas and by being patient and by listening, we will meet our children's need to be seen and to be heard. And they will more readily engage in un uninterrupted play without the need for our attention. So we can be present and we can step back and we can record our child's play. We can provide the safety of love and respect for their efficacy and discovery for who they are and, and who they're becoming. And when we change the environment based on our observation and listening to create spaces where children can freely build and explore and create and engage in risk taking, again, they're experiencing the safety provided by our love. So the environment we create and the materials we provide can actually communicate our attention to our children even if we're not there, even if we're working somewhere else in the home, even when we're not physically present. And, you know, technology can also provide space for children to engage in uninterrupted, unmediated engagement with their peers. Children can play with each other in virtual space via services like Zoom. Just like adults, you know, children need time to check in with each other, to share news and information, to play alongside one another. There's a deep need, and it means just as with play in the physical world, we must be prepared to step back and allow for conversations and interactions to take place that may make us uncomfortable. But some children aren't comfortable in this space. And you know, many families don't have access to technology. So again, there isn't one, one size fits all answer. But in short, really children need play. They need other children. They need to be heard and seen. They need routines and reasonable expectations. They need to understand the world on their own terms in a safe environment. Ideally, they will have people around them who will also seek to understand their understanding of the world on their terms. And we can create this even with social distancing. It requires a degree of intentionality, but the rewards are vast. The health and happiness of our children and our health and happiness as well. But if we can't do all of that and we can only do one thing, then we must just step back and let children play. Awesome, Jesse. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so much of there, what you said is really important. But one of the things I keep thinking, like, I really love how you're telling parents how to make this happen, right? Because I think what we're not doing is we're not giving parents and some, some children who are not, you know, they're not used to this. Schooling had them used to one way of being, right? And, and the parents, and so you're giving them tools on how to do this, right? Because I know if you're working from home, you need your child to be able to let you do your work for a few hours uninterrupted. And that's what they're struggling with because the online schooling is so new that they need help, right? They can't do that on their own, but you can work with your child to do self-directed play. And then you'll see them they don't need to, right? They'll be engaged in the play for, for a long time and you might need, you know, check in and, and give them some feedback throughout, but they, we wanna get them to that point, right? Where they can do that if you're gonna be doing this work from home, school from home situation, right? But it's, it's not gonna happen yeah. in the online schooling. So, and, and, so thank you. And I think something that's really critical is just this role of listening. 
um, that we can't always listen to our children, but when there are moments that we're together, if we can really, really listen, then when those times come when we need them to be independent, it's much easier to break that, that kind of, that, that, that bind that can happen because they've been heard, like they've been listened to. They don't need to pull you out of whatever you're doing to refocus your attention because you've fully, fully given them your attention in those other instances. So I think listening structure in other aspects of the day can create a lot of space for children to just do their own thing. Um, and, and this is probably in some extent from a more bourgeois perspective where, you know, a parent's at home working on their computer, doing their, their Zoom meetings, and you need your child to leave you alone. Um, but I think for everybody, if you step back, if you listen to children, they're gonna play on their own. Um, and that's really important um, for them, you know, as Peter was saying, to process the things that they're encountering, to have the power that comes from being, you know, in, in themselves, uh, it's critical. Absolutely. Anyone else want to follow up on what Disney was just talking about? I wanted to add also that there's an important piece of sort of building stamina for children too, when they have this expectation in a school setting and not at home, and then we're switching to children being at home all the time. I think there is need for support for parents when they're setting up these routines and sticking with them over time, which maybe children are very familiar with in a, in a school setting or not, but um, offering that time is also offering the expectation that we have time apart, or this is your work, which is play, and this is what my work, which is Zoom, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really good point, Kate. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think clear, you know, clarity, like clarity, of roles and expectations, again, listening. So if the night before you're talking about the environment you're gonna set up for play tomorrow based on observing what the child was interested in today, you know, oh, I, today I saw you were in the sink, so tomorrow, you know, I, what do you want for the sink? And the child says, you know, or my child, for instance, will say, you know, I want more soap and I want a strainer. You put that out, you talk about it at breakfast and you've got two hours to work because all of those needs have been discussed and met in that, like the clear expectation. And you know, you know this, uh, you know, Denisha and Kate, and I think everyone on this panel, that young children need to know what's gonna happen next. You know, they need to have a sense of, of routine in order to truly feel safe and to plan themselves, children plan. You know, they wanna plan and know what to rely on. So if you can be a reliable listener, a reflective supporter of the child's play, then you know there's this incredible, this is kind of this incredible dialogue that can happen in your time, like a time dialogue. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Wow. Well, this is great. And I know we can, we can stop here and keep talking about this. We're, we're going to keep going um, to our next panelist, who is Kate Woodford. Kate is the directress and lead teacher of El Mundo de Niños Bilingual Early Learning Center. Um, as I mentioned, Kate is one of, we are members of this Andi Play Fellowship group, like the 28 people. And I know, I, I know Kate talked about this to us about how moving was, but we were all like, when we met Kate and she's like, oh, I run a play-based family program. And we were all like, yes, right? Because we know how important family childcare is to early child education, but rarely do we get to work with family childcare providers and learn from them. And myself, if I'm ever fortunate to need childcare for a young child, it's gotta be family childcare and it's got to be play-based. So knowing um, that Kate's doing that it's for, for really young children is great. I can imagine like toddlers in a program like Kate and then preschool age in a program like Keisha's, right? And then, and then they're just never going to go to public school because I'm going to just keep them in your program forever, right? Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us, Kate. And so I was hoping um, that you can really talk about the family child care perspective and how you can support children through play while they're isolated at home. Thank you, Denisha, so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here today and in conversation with all of you. Um, today, I'd love to talk just a little bit about sort of the unique, the unique place that family child care plays in this whole conversation around early childhood, because I think we have a special place that we can play based on the relationships that we already have with families, with children and families. And, um, so some of the ways I think that be, because family child care is a small group uh, gives us the opportunity to have these deep, deep relationships, not only with the children, but also with the families and the extended families in some case, depending on um, different children's support systems. And I think at the very beginning of uh, the stay at home orders in the pandemic, 
it was really notable the stressors on parents of having their children at home all day and not knowing what to do with them, especially when many parents had to be working from home. And while as early childhood educators, we know what it's like to spend nine hours with children, enjoy it, and really delight in all their learning, I think there's something to be said for the fact that many parents don't have that experience with their own children or other children. And so sort of centering back into sharing with families what the stances that we take as teachers that can be somehow translated to the homes. So for example, I have uh, the opportunity to communicate specifically with each of my families. And one of the things that I encourage all of my parents to do is step back and really trust their children, their innate capacities, their interests, and really trust that through play, they are learning. And I think that a lot of parents from you know social media from the myriad of resources that are thrown at everyone on a day-to-day -day basis focusing on you know a virtual space or even um even just the amount of toys that are available for purchase i think that there's this pressure put on parents to be on 100 percent of the time or engaging with their children or providing with them providing with them an activity or an art project and things like that. And I think that parents don't realize that the majority of the day that they spend in my program, they're playing and they don't need me at all. And so I realized that this is a reality that parents have to kind of shift and learn now that they're, they're at home with their children, especially for children who are only children at home with their parents and their parents have to work. And so I've encouraged families to really set up within their routine a self-determined playtime, be it rest time when the you know, child is alone in their room or a period during the day when the expectation is that the child is playing and that is their work and the parent has space to do something else. And I think that this is important in going back to what Jesse was saying about supporting parents through this as well. When parents have the space away from their children and children likewise have the space away from their parents to play, the time that they do spend together engaging is much, uh, much more connected and fulfills the needs of the children and caregiver relationship that the children are seeking out in stressful times. Um, another thing that I think is very unique about family child care is the ability to really cater your support to each of the families that I work with. So when I contacted each of the families at the very beginning of the pandemic and throughout, I've offered different kinds of supports to different families. Some people needed support around routines and setting up expectations in their home. Some people needed support around the emotional shifts that their children were going through. And because I have a deep relationship with their child and parents know that I care for them and love their child as sort of the foundation of our relationship, I have something to say about how you can, how you can support your child in this. And it becomes more of a partnership, even though their child is not coming to my program. In addition to this, I've done a lot of sharing with parents the experiences that we've had here at my program. So through documentation like videos and photographs, I can show parents and have been working with parents prior to uh, the pandemic in explaining to them the stance that we take as teachers here and how we see learning through open-ended play. I implement the Angie Play approach here in my program, and so a lot of my time as an educator is spent reflecting on watching children play and reflecting on their learning. And so I have experience watching a seemingly simple play interaction with a child all by themselves and really being able to see all of the ways that the child is learning. This year will be a little bit of a shift because uh, I have a handful of kindergartners that weren't with me last year who will likely be continuing this year because our schools here in Wisconsin will be virtual until at least October. And so I assume there's going to be a little bit of a push from certain parents around academics or how I need to support their children. And I think this is where I have to continue to teach parents and show through experiences how much their children are learning through open-ended play, through self-determined play, and really recognizing that when the children have the trust, in, when we trust them as adults to be learning and that they are, you know, 
they have this innate curiosity within them and drive to learn. When we give them this trust and this freedom, children tend to learn way more than we would ever expect of them. And so part of the way I hope to continue to support families um, after opening in the fall is to communicate these different ways that in the classroom their children are learning through play so that when they're at home and have the opportunity or within their routine to provide space and time for their children to interact with materials they understand that it's not it's not time wasted which i think is what a lot of parents think that if their children aren't engaging one-on-one -on -one, then they, well then they should be occupied with something when actually they can be learning and growing and processing everything that's happening around them through play when the when the parent is not engaged um, so i think that it's important some another way that you know i've helped also lending out materials and books and things like that according to the interests of the children open-ended things like play silks or rings or blocks and i have the ability to do that because i have few families in my program, but also it's a way to sort of gently nudge families toward, toward utilizing basic materials or offering basic materials within, this, within the environment for their children to engage with. So for example, if um, I know a lot of people talk about their worry that you know families don't have the same resources, which is a very real, <laughs> real situation that many families don't have the same play resources or materials that they might have in a school setting at home but sharing with families about process art and about loose parts play and the ways that recycled materials can be used for play or boxes or tops or um, there are many ways to access you know, or even just a sheet you may have at your house or a pillowcase are all materials that parents might not recognize as learning materials, but that can be used within the home. So I think that family child care has a unique place in being able to support the whole family, both emotionally and also with resources and materials to hopefully, um, yeah, support the children in the end. That is great, Kate. Thank you. I mean, that's so, I think that's so important, right? To showing parents, you, you can have your kids playing at home the way I have them playing in my home and it's going to be good for them and it's going to be good for you. Um, and that's really important for them to see. And yes, the things about the materials, you know, when this all started, I wrote a blog for DEY because I, I'd read a post somewhere that we can't just tell kids to play because what if they don't have toys? Look I, look, I don't have any children of my own, but I know the box is the toy sometimes, right? Like kids don't need a lot of fancy toys. They need time, space, encouragement, freedom, right? And they're going to do it and they're going to manipulate materials. And it's better that it's an open-ended material or a loose part material, right? So we talked about, you know, I, I imagine if I had young children in my apartment, like what would I tell them to play with? Well, let's get these cushions out and, and, and let's use these big law books I have as blocks and let's do all of these other things and build with them. So, so thank you for sharing that. And so we've got the rest of the panel back and I'd, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on what Kate just shared. Can I just show one quick thing? This is Diane. Sure, turn on your video, Diane. Truth Family Play Plans. It's backwards, sorry. No, it's good. We can see it. <laughs> um, at T-R-U-C-E, teachers.org, there are things for summer, fall, winter, spring. Each, there's a guide for each one, and it was developed specifically for that reason that parents don't realize they don't need a lot of resources. There's all kinds of things they can do with their kids that can be fun and playful. You know, boxes, leaves, Play-Doh. It has a Play-Doh recipe. You know, there's just flour and salt. Um, so you can see with that, you know, mud. But the idea, again, is, you know, a lot of parents at this point of young children didn't play very well themselves because they were so hooked to screens and getting more traditional teaching at school. So the idea of thinking about positive, non-critical ways to facilitate um, is really important. So thank you, Kate, for talking about those things. I just want to add one more thing. Thank you, Diane, for adding that. Someone was asking about older children. Well, I have three children of my own, five, eight, and 10. And 
they've been sort of practicing this, you know, true play, this expectation that they will play and that they don't need us for play so many years that there are days when I wonder what they've done all day or, you know, but it's the same 10 year old and eight year old and five year old who are engaging with the same materials. And just as Diane showed us the, the Play-Doh, the sand, the level of mastery that children show or interest that they show over time changes, but the same basic materials can be, can be so useful for play and learning for all these different ages. Think. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for mentoring older children. Do you mind if I just say one really sure. quick thing? Sure, go ahead. One thing I think that's really important that, that Kate brings up, I think everybody's brought up, is just how important it is for adults to understand and respond to the needs of children, to understand their own needs. But, you know, I think right now, teachers and schools play a really critical role in listening to the needs of parents at home. You know, Ms. Chung was dealing with parents in her own community who said, my children need to, they need to learn, they need to be safe. And so what she said is that's, that's a great need, right? Needing your child to learn is great. I'm gonna show you what learning really looks like. And so something that we do in our advice to our programs is listening to parents' needs and understanding what they mean with the expertise of being an early childhood educator. So if a parent is saying, I want activities, oftentimes the need is, I want my child to be occupied. So it's showing them a better way for their child to be occupied. So it's not saying you're wrong because you want learning, you're wrong because you're focused on academics. Like, no, you're right. Your child does need to be occupied. Well, here's a way they can be occupied. Your child should learn. Here's, here's the way that play is learning. So, you know, having that connection is really important of listening and hearing the parents and families' needs too. And that creates a great degree of trust. Thanks, Jesse. Go ahead, Marcia. If I could um, add, or what jumped into my mind, is this notion um, that parents need to feel like they're doing a good job. And there's, there's a, um, you know, a thing called the good enough parent. And maybe Peter can talk to that more. But, you know, parents need to know that, that, you know, letting them play and giving them the tools, as, as, as Jesse just said, um, it, it's really important. They need to feel like they're doing a good job. Otherwise, they're going to uh, the internalized stress that they have is going to be projected back on the child. So again, it's a circular thing here. Thank you for that point, Marcy, definitely. And we're seeing in the chat that a lot of people are saying it's, it's helping the parents. It's helping the parents for sure, for sure. And we as teachers have to combat against, you know, commercialism that's trying to get them at the other way saying like, no, actually this toy, actually this, you know, app is better for your child. So I think really showing parents how learning is happening is, has really been poignant for my families. Definitely. Thank you all. All right. Up next is one of my favorite people. Keisha Reed is the founder of Play Empowers and the owner Discovery Early Learning Center, a place for childhood. I, Keisha, I can't remember how we met. If it was just I joined Play Empowers and then no. we met. No. Remind we, me. We met at DEY, uh, right. the, one of their first events, and you stood up and said, my name is Denisha, Denisha, and I'm in the Badass Teachers Association. And I said, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that. Thank you. <laughs> that was the organizing meeting, the first one I went to when I met defending the early years. Absolutely great. I knew we had met at one of the events, and I was like, I can't remember which one, um, but I'm so happy we did one. I'm not even going to lie. You're a black woman promoting play. Woo hoo! We need more black women and men promoting play in early childhood. So thank you, thank you. That warms my heart. Um, and you were so close to me when I was in DC in Poolsville, Maryland, and you're in Poolsville, Maryland, running your center. I'm definitely planning a visit, whether I get the grant to study you or not. I'm coming to the new Come place. On. I'm gonna spend a couple of days because I'm not gonna want to leave, and I'm gonna want to observe because I, I just I see I love being in play empowered. One of the best parts of my day was going on Facebook and seeing everybody post their play pics from the day. And it was just like, it was just really heartwarming to know that children were out there getting really amazing playing experiences. So thank you for running Play Empowers for the play retreat, which I got to speak at. All of the stuff, you're in the True Play Summit, which has been amazing. We were gonna have you present at the second annual True Play Conference, but that got postponed. So um, you're just doing a lot of amazing work. And, and I really just appreciate your deep understanding of this idea that play is learning. Play is authentic learning, right? So I kind of frame this question as like, 
like, I don't know, kind of on the fly, like how can play mitigate the loss of learning as a result of school closing kind of with this idea where Keisha's going to be like, but there isn't loss of learning. Yeah, there isn't loss of learning. There so I'll leave it there for you to I mean, if over. it's loss, was it really learning? You know, Thank was you. it really learning? I think there's a big difference between that um, rote memorized um, teaching to the test type of learning, that surface learning is what I call it, and the deep primal learning that you get through active play and involvement with your world. And I want to use a little bit of this time because a couple of the speakers who spoke before me, Kate spoke a lot about um, a position that I take on that, that community aspect. And when the whole COVID thing first went down, I think it was like someone took a rug and just took it from all under all of us, you know? I no longer had my normal role of day-to-day -day interacting with these children and families. The families no longer had their normal role of bringing the children to me and being able to observe from the other side that, that play and that learning that happens. We had to switch roles and, and then magic happened. So one of our slogans for our school is a community of learners. And it was then that I knew that I was able to see that that, that that slogan is real. Like we have all learned and grown so much together around these children. Um, and I feel like this experience, as horrible as it is, is giving us the opportunity for parents to really step into that role. Um, and I saw something that um, really made me feel the way, I, I don't know, it bought, it bought to me thoughts of the Reggio Emilia uh, and how that type of schooling came about, you know, kind of out of the ashes of something horrible. Because I watched a community come together so fast to provide for families who may not have the ability to stay home from work, who may not have food for their children, um, who may not have access to the Wi-Fi that they need for schools. I watched a community come together and immediately make that happen. So what happened when I saw that was a light bulb went off in my head. You know, we so often hear there's not enough funding and, you know, we can't do this and school's not childcare. But in fact, it should be. If we are going to send our children into a place for six to eight hours a day, they need to be getting that type of wraparound care, that social emotional care, that, um, that opportunity to do what we all know children need to do, which is have autonomy, which is play, which is actively engage in their environment. And so this rug is pulled from under all of us and we're all scrambling. My parents and I um, decided that we were going to do our best as a community to continue to keep things as, as far as play goes, as normal as possible for the children. And one of the things that happened were, parents started to create environments in their own home. They were sending me photos of their backyard, which were slowly but surely starting to look like discovery. And if you know what discovery looks like, that means uh, a cross between a beautiful nature playground and a junkyard. <laughs> so it was wonderful to see families really taking what they had learned in this community together and how important that they understood play to be and creating that in their own home. That not only gave the children that, that opportunity to play that they needed, but it gave them that social connection, that emotional connection to normalcy. And I think that is the biggest thing that is missing um, when the rug was torn from under us, all of us, adults and children alike, normalcy was gone. So I watched as my community um, begin to design different ways to keep that in their children's lives. And, and some of the ways I'll talk about today, I found to be so creative. And I, I'm, I'm really happy that I gave them, I don't want to say I gave them anything. I, I, I trusted the parents to continue what we have been doing together all of this time. I was there for them when they had questions, when they had concerns, when something wasn't working out, but I really trusted them to um, provide the support that their children needed. And they blew me away. They absolutely blew me away. Um, one family has a child whose best friend who they've gone to my school together since they were babies. They were used to seeing each other every single day. And now suddenly with this new virus, they can't see each other. So the parents got very creative and they started doing um, visits to the child's house. So you, mo you might not physically touch each other, but they would go to their house and draw a picture for them in chalk on their sidewalk. 
And then the next time, the next child would do the same. And it, it went from that to then book exchanges. And then it went from that to, okay, at school on Fridays, we have pizza day. So they started having virtual pizza day. Um, just watching these families come up with these different ways for their children to connect was so magical. And the reminder that the relationship and the connection is the foundation of our work here. So if we have that relationship and that connection, that level of trust rises, right? Because we know the child. We know the family. The parent begins to know the child. Watching this take place was magical. But then recently, they just announced that school is going to be virtual. Many, many families are, are just not feeling comfortable with that. So there's a new um, fire that has ignited, that has really excited me. And I think it's going to excite Peter as well. Homeschooling. Families are deciding to pull back for a year or for six months or for however, however long, and they're deciding to homeschool. And when they're making this choice, they're having, I'm, I'm on this group and I'm listening to parents talk and they're talking about um, very focused on academics, very focused on packages that they can get and things, ways that they can um, teach their child that mimic kind of what traditional school looks like. So I feel like our, our opportunity now is to really show play, to really document and share with our communities, within our communities. And that's what, I, what I'm going to do in this group. I'm going to share with my community what play looks like and how children learn through it so that families can begin to, instead of duplicating what we see in a school system that we know is not working for children, we can start to think about the whys and how we can change it. One of the things that I know we can change is we can begin to do more wrap around care for children. And what that means is um, social, social things, um, food. If there are children that need food, how can our system that we provide as a community to care for children support that need? Whether it be job training for parents, there's a lot of that with, with Head Start but why does it end at four years old? Why is it not something that we keep in, inside of our schooling and our, our, our social framework of our communities uh, going forward? Um, I think this is a time for change. There is a school in Baltimore called City Neighbor School. And I visited that school and I walked in and you could feel the respect for childhood. You could feel the respect for community. You could feel the respect for not just the child in that space, but the child as a whole. And I think that that school, as well as many others, is a good model for what we should start looking at when we go back to school. So I may have gotten off your, your question, but I, I think it's really important for us to take this time and start to change what schooling looks like. No, I think Thank you answered you the question you. perfectly. <laughs> and I love, you know, that you talked about Reggio because that was one of the things that always struck me was like how that got founded, right? Looking at the devastation that was caused by these rampant fascist ideologies and beliefs and saying, we will not let this happen again. And that, and we will do that by investing in quality early childhood. That to me is just so powerful. And I think you're right. We have to look now. COVID-19, this pandemic has uprooted what it means to, for, to deliver education through public schooling. And we can look at all the things that were problematic about that. And we can, we can make something different, right? So thank you for, for bringing that. Um, so I see the panelists are back and I'd love to hear from some of, some of you on your thoughts as well. I don't know if someone's asking what the name, oh, the school you mentioned, Keisha, someone's asking in there. It's school. called City Neighbor School and it's in Baltimore. It is elementary all the way up to high school. Oh, wow, yeah. And it really focuses on the whole child. It really focuses on um, um, an environment that is, it's, it's not a scary school, it's not a free school, but it is a, a version of school that is steeped in respect for childhood and human development, as opposed to um, looking from the top down and creating workers. <laughs> you know, there's a whole, different, a whole different level of respect there, and you feel it as soon as you walk in. And I think that that is a good model, because I don't think that this play thing and this interactive learning thing needs to stop at five years old. I think this is something that needs to go up, and I like what China's doing, because it's going, let's stop the trickle down and let's trickle up, okay? Let's start trickling yeah. up and have this, this 
this idea of schools, instead of us getting kids ready for school, have the idea of schools being ready for these children. And I don't mean the, the just the head. I mean the entire child and their family. What is it that this child needs to be successful in this space? I love that. We need a push up of early childhood values and practices, push it up into the early grades. And I remember at the True Play conference, this kind of came up with how they were doing this in China was that they were taking the first grade teachers to the Anji classrooms. And then the teachers were like, wow, we didn't know the kids could do all this. <laughs> and it made them really realize how they were shortchanging the children when they left that program because the kids were doing so much more here than they were allowing them there. And that got them thinking then, well, how can we bring this up, right? And that's what we really need. I've seen people in the chat saying, how do we get this, you know, how do we get people involved? And, you know, Jesse can speak about this more, but like, we have to play in Anji materials, right, in that space to remember why it's so valuable, why it's so great, right? So you need adults and teachers and parents to play again, right? We, do a, we did a lot of playing at our retreats, right? We, we, one time it was just blue tape. That was the only prop they gave us and told us to like play with tape for 15 minutes. And I don't think I've laughed that hard since then, right? Because we had a really good time as adults playing with this, right? But we have to tap into those, to that play and see it and witness it for ourselves to then remember why this is so important for children. Well, and I think, you know, what Keisha's saying is so critical that just relationships are the basis of like really deep learning and like change. And so Keisha, you're going to be so much more of an expert on those children, what they're capable of, who they are, how smart they are, then whatever primary is gonna take them. And so if they had your knowledge yes. and then they had the freedom to respond to that, the learning they could provide would be so much richer, be so much more responsive. Um, the, yeah, just listening, hearing children, hearing their stories, hearing parents, um, you know, just coming back to that relationship piece. You know, if, if there's I wonder how, play, I wonder yeah. how we can make a bridge between early childhood and beyond. Because right now I feel like, for me at least, it's, it's what my work that I do with the children, and then they leave me, and then it's, they're gone, right? So how, how can we, um, this is my project I'm going to think for myself, is how can I create a bridges moving forward for the children, regardless of if they do homeschooling, or if they go to public school or another private school, that bridge, I think what you just said is we have a bank of knowledge, just like the families have a bank of knowledge about their child. And I think it will serve everyone well to have that knowledge be shared. Well, one of the things is to remember early childhood goes to third grade. Exactly. Why can't, why can't children stay in your program and Kate's program? I'm trying program? to make it happen. <laughs> right? And, and not, but, but not that you have to then implement a K through three state mandated curriculum in your yes. program, but you can do what you're doing for children up to third grade, fourth grade, eight years old, 10 years old, whatever, right? We need that kind of freedom, right? To say that's what real choice is about. That I, as a parent, choose to say, I want my kid in this type of environment for as long as I want them in it. And, and that's my you choice. Know it, you know, yeah. You know what? So because I'm, I'm working on opening up a kindergarten, I have been having to look at different curriculums. Not I'm going to have, but just to know what the parents are asking me about when they say, do I have a curriculum? Because I already know my answer. But I said, let me just see what this is all about. And to be completely honest, I have toddlers who are beyond that because I feel like the way that they're structuring their rote memorized work again is so surface and so um, it's roadblocking the children. Like they soar so much further past that with play. So I feel confident in saying, Oh, don't you, they don't have to worry about that. Like Peter said, it doesn't matter what grade that they start schooling. They are not behind because play and living life, in an engaged, active, well-equipped, and when I say well-equipped, I mean with open-ended materials, not toys, environment, then the children just soar. Yeah. Academically, right. physically, emotionally, socially, all of those things. But I mean, something that you've done so brilliantly is to, to articulate the learning that's taking place so that people can see that, right? So it's not just, oh, play is great, play is wonderful, but no, here, like, look at this you know, owning the expertise of an early educator. I'm an expert on children's learning. I'm an expert in these children. And I'm going to show you how deep that learning is. I saw a, what's considered a very innovative curriculum that's very popular in the United States 
that had a month long that had, they had a month long lesson plan for kindergartners on talking about your favorite toy. You know, yeah. in your program in Anji, children are talking about a wide range of materials and the complex physics that's taking place. Yes. Seriously, like a month long so that they can have literacy about writing a story about a toy. I mean, you know, I don't want to say give me a break, but give me a break. Give me a break, yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, just really quickly, Keisha, I remember asking you when I was, when I was in DC and I, you know, I'm teaching my early childhood students and I was like, well, how do you do lesson planning in a in a in a play program and can you share i don't know if you remember what you said but can you share like how like when you have an intern like learning with you like how do you bring them like it's a total reverse right of what yeah, you actually I was gonna say did. um i don't do lesson plans ahead of time because how in the world am i supposed to know what like like uh jesse just said there are 50 million things going on in my classroom and if i was to do a, a, a authentic box lesson plan it would be from the ceiling to the floor if i really did so what i do is a lot of documentation learning stories and i do um i, I used to do what's called reverse planning uh, i don't even want to call it that now i'll just lean on documentation i i observe the children like my role is to observe them to take that information and share it with their families and sometimes take that information and share it with the child and also to alter the environment. Alter the environment so that it could be there for them the next day. And when I say alter, I don't wanna say something that Kate said I would shake her head to was, these materials are the same materials they've been using since they were toddlers. It's not the material that has the magic, it's the child. So as the child grows and matures and understands and has a deeper relationship with that material, the way they use it is different. What they learn of it is different. So um, my planning, if you, if you call it that, is the stories that I create, the documentation that I provide families to see what happened. Not what will happen, because none of us know, not in an authentic play-based program, I have no idea, but what did happen and what does it mean? Yeah, and I think that's so key. You know, I work in teacher education, so it's like we don't teach teachers to do that, right? So instead of going in with this plan of what you want to do, step back, observe the children, right? And then document what they did and what the learning did occur. You are no longer planning learning environments for children. You're documenting the learning that they're doing. And then you can go back and look at the standards and look at what they're doing and say, okay, is there something they're not engaging in that we think they should? And, and then what kind of material can I introduce that may or may not lead to that and you don't know it's like an experiment right I don't know how they're going to engage with this material and so you put it out there and you see and you document it and then you see you know and so what I'm learning and you know from you and from my time and Anji and working with all these teachers right is that we in teacher education have to change how we're preparing teachers if mm -hmm. we want them to enact what is and actually a play pedagogy right because it's not the same thing than, than what we really what we normally do right no more themes and units right yeah, so even the even the even the Maryland State Department of Education's curriculum, I was shocked. I was, I mean, jaw drop, for real. For kindergarten and first grade, it's theme based, and it's not even like engaging themes. It's like, like you said, Jesse. It's like getting to know my family, and it's a whole month, and it's like scripted down to the T. And I'm like, we do that through the year all the time, you know? A child bought in a walk one day, and another child's like, what is that? And they had this whole dialogue sharing about her father, who's from Indonesia, and we cooked this, and then it turned into this whole big experience. And you can't really plan that in a one-month segment and that's why they're worried about loss of learning, Denisha, because you will lose that box. That box is, when that box is done, that box is pruned. It's gone. So we have to, in, in more ways than one, we have to think out of the box. Definitely. Peter, I saw you wanted to say something. Let's have you give the last word before we get to our final panelists. Oh, the last word. Okay. I, I just wanted, when people were talking about uh, trickling up, um, and bring this to higher higher um, grades. Um, a lot of my research is on how children learn when they're playing in mixed age groups. Mm -hmm. You know, play in seg age segregated groups is a very abnormal thing from a biological point of view. We never segregated children by age until we started putting them in schools. So when children are playing across age, the younger children are constantly learning from the older children. So when I, what I observe in, in schools where children are not taught to, to read, 
everybody learns to read. And the reason they learn to read is the younger children are playing games that involve reading with the older children. They're also playing games that involve adding up scores and calculating averages. They're playing games that involve throwing baseballs back and forth. That we are really handicapping our children when we segregate them by age. So one of the things I would really push for if I were involved in school policy is, is age mixed classrooms. Um, certainly there's no reason to segregate kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. They should all be mixed together. And you would, what you would find is the little kids would learn to read from the older kids and they would learn numbers from the older kids and they would, and they would learn it naturally and in play. All you have to do is set up the environment that's a rich play environment that involves games, that involve numbers and involves reading. And you know, we demonize the screen, but the truth of the matter is, lots of children learn to read because they're playing video games that involve reading. <laughs> I've seen lots of them learn how to write because they're texting with one another. And uh, we, shouldn't be, we, shouldn't, we should be admitting that that's part of our, of our environment. That's part of our world today. And this, these are incredible uh, learning tools. We shouldn't be depriving our children of them. So we need to enrich the children's environment by providing age mixing, by providing all kinds of ways of playing not by taking opportunities away. Awesome, thank you so much, Peter. All right, this is, I can't believe we're, we're getting almost to the, last, to the end here. Um, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to our final panelist of today. Marcy Gademi is a National Early Childhood Consultant. She is the board treasurer for Defending the Early Years. Um, she recently joined us and immediately we, when I, you know, I moved to New York and she was in town and we got to go out and talk about just our love for early childhood education and for play. Um, Marcy has just so much experience, the former CEO and executive director of the Giselle Institute to and her work with the um, IPA, which I'm going to mess up what the international play. I'll talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so welcome, Marcy. Thank you for, for being on the panel. Um, and for you, we want you to really talk about um, how the importance of pretend play as therapeutic, right? And really thinking what should parents and teachers do to facilitate pretend play so this can happen? Okay, well, thank you first for um, having me, and I'm very proud of the work that we do here at DEY. Um, I also wanted to thank real quickly, Blakely, Nancy, Diane, Catherine, Nancy R, and uh, Jiro, um, and the rest of the team, um, because this has been an absolutely amazing institute, and I, I would say it's definitely a success. The reason I made slides is, is twofold. One is I'm the last speaker, and so I really wanted to stay on track with what I was doing. And then the second reason I made slides is some of you are visual learners, and you like to, to look at something while um, someone is talking. So anyway, um, let me um, get started. And um, as I said before, I'm, I'm delighted to be the treasurer of, of DEY, but I also have a long history um, with IPA, and actually I'm the historian of the American um, Association of, of the Child's Right to Play. And our original name was um, Promoting the Child's Right to Play. And this um, organization was actually founded in 1961 after the uh, 1959 Declaration of Rights for Children, which then was superseded by the um, 1989 United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I was, I was so um, pleased when um, Takima um, brought this up because it really does give a wonderful definition of what is a thriving child. And, I, and again, I, I want all of us to be able to go back to this. But we've been working for years and years um, to get the United States to ratify this thing. And I checked yesterday to make sure I was still on target by saying this, but the United States is, is the only nation, um, you know, uh, industrialized nation who has not ratified it. Um, but there are three reasons why. Um, and again, because I've done so much work with, with Children's Right Campaign that um, uh, this is what they talk about. The three reasons why it's not ratified is one, fear of um, loss of parental rights. So that's number one. Um, um, parents don't want to give up their rights to be a parent. 
The second one is, um, is kind of an anti-pro-choice um, um, theory um, because the convention actually guarantees the rights of the child from conception. So from conception to age 18 um, um, is what the, um, the convention talks about. So, you know, our anti, um, uh, it is an anti-pro-choice um, for, uh, or that's how some people view it. The third thing, which I think is, is just incredible and very sad and devastating is um, it would be a violation of state rights because some of those state rights are um, very, um, harsh punishments for um, juveniles who create uh, or who um, enact criminal um, acts. So again, um, those are the three reasons why we haven't um, ratified it yet, and I'm still hoping that we we will. Um, but I want to just start, and everybody has said this. Um, every panel has kind of gotten to this point. We need to seize this opportunity for a new paradigm for early childhood education. Um, the time could not be more um, um, wonderful, <laughs> and the opportunity is here for us to seize. We really do need to um, base all this on the science of child development. I'm, I'm very pleased that other people have brought up um, you know, some of our other, um, if you will, theorists, um, and, and the new uh, paradigm needs to be based on social, social justice, as, we, as we've all have said, and guarantees quality for all children, regardless of your, your race or your income. And of course, play must be the foundation. So um, first, let me just say that I have been studying play for years and years and years and years. That's the reason I'm a, the historian for IPA USA. Um, but as of late, I've, I've really come to this, this, this notion that all play is important. And everyone's talked about all these different types of play and they're all important, but the, the, the highest level of play and the most important play I believe, and other researchers do as well, is what we call sociodramatic play. And you know what pretend play is, you know what make-believe play is. So sociodramatic play is um, that pretend play, dramatic play, but with others. So that's, that's like I said, I think the, the highest form. And the reason I think it's the highest form is because it's the, the best um, developer, if you will, of executive functioning skills. And if you look down that list of, of the skills that make up executive functioning, these are the, the skills that we want um, not only children to have as they embark on, on their, you know, the rest of their formal education, but also these are the, the qualities that we want um, for our citizens of the United States and our workforce. Um, and this is what James Heckman is talking about now, is preparing you know, the workforce for the 24, uh, 21st century, but they absolutely need these executive functions functioning skills and this mature sociodramatic play with all the turn taking and perspective taking and communication problem solving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is what's going to prepare um, 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 our next workforce and, and adults in, in this um, society. So um, I was excited to talk about this notion that dramatic play is actually therapeutic. And the very first time I heard this, I, I was just blown away because um, when you talk about, you know, uh, psychotherapy for adults, um, you, you have an image of what psychotherapy is for an adult. But what adults really do, probably on a daily basis, um, is they, they play things over in their mind. So as they're daydreaming or as they're thinking about something, they're, they're um, um, relieving the trauma of whatever it be, you know, whether they're going to ask the boss for a new job or how is it that we're going to uh, misspeak today um, with our um, um, different panels. Um, but that's what adults do. They do it in their, in their mind with um, daydreaming. Um, they also do it through language, of course, by telling everyone they know about the speeding ticket they got. So this is therapeutic. And the more you talk about that speeding ticket, the less the pain becomes, and that's therapeutic. 
Well, that's what children do in play. They are actually playing those, those tough um, themes and those issues that are troubling to them and, and really causing them concern. I, I do want to point out that this type of play can happen both in the microsphere, which would be like with a dollhouse or um, little figures or whatever, and it can happen in the macrosphere where the child actually acts out and um, acts it out, um, um, the dramatizes, and um, acting it out with others. So as I said, um, play is very healing when they go over and over um, playing the, the different um, themes like that. I wanted to share with you um, a couple of real life examples. My, my own daughter, when she was in preschool, she had a problem with nap time. And one day I noticed in her bedroom that she had laid out a little blanket, actually five or six little blankets around the, the bedroom. And on each blanket, she put either a doll or a stuffed animal face down. And then she sat on her little chair and, you know, at the front of the room, if you will, and um, I don't want to hear you talking. I don't want to see any eyes. This is nap time. And she would play that theme over and over because again, that was very healing and very cathartic for her um, to do that. Another example, um, I have two more examples that I wanna do real quick, but my husband who um, is a preschool teacher or was a preschool teacher, um, he one time came home and told me about this little guy that he had that would um, go into the uh, the homekeeping area, housekeeping area and pick up the phone and he'd say, I don't want you calling anymore. Um, I've had it. This is it. I cannot take this anymore. And then slam the phone down really hard. And then the child would pick it up and do it all over again, over and over. And children need to play that theme over and over again, because the more they play the theme, the deeper they get into, into those, those feelings and, and inner emotions. So they need to do that. Um, the, the last example I want to give you, um, again, from my husband's classroom, but he had a little child, a little boy, whose father was um, actually arrested. Um, the police came into his apartment, into their apartment, and they arrested um, that, that father. And the play that this child did in the classroom was to um, want to play, okay, let's play that the police are coming. We've got to hide. Everyone hide. The police are coming. I just wanted to play that theme over and over again. So again, you, could, you can see, um, hopefully, you know, from these few examples that I've given you, and, and there's plenty more examples that I'm sure all of you can um, share with uh, the panelists and everyone else can share as well. But children need that opportunity to, to really, um, really, uh, like I said, work out their emotions. So what's going to happen, um, and the, not what's going to happen with children coming back to school, um, but what's going to happen with our, our children and what is happening with our children? You know, what we're seeing is acting out. We're seeing aggression. We're seeing regression. You know, they're going back to wetting the bed and wanting you to sleep with them, and they're clingy, and, and they're withdrawing. Um, they're, uh, so again, these are the symptoms that we're going to see, but again, um, the being able to play, and I was so happy to hear everyone, I mean, all this panel talking about the need for children to just really play and not, not um, adult or teacher directed play, but for, for child to say what themes they want to play and what they need to act out. Uh, I actually read an article that was in New York Times about two, two um, or three weeks ago. And the writer was talking about her five-year-old child um, during the pandemic. And all the child wants to play is for the mother to be the daughter and for the daughter, for the child to be the older sister. And so the older sister, you know, playing the older sister keeps telling the child, who is the mother, um, you know, don't touch that. You need to put your mask on. Um, we, we are going to do this. We've got to wash our hands. But being very critical of what the, um, the, the parent is, is doing as, you know, um, so she was working out her 
her fear and frustration and trauma of what's going on with the pandemic. Um, the story is actually a little bit deeper than that, but I can't um, go into the whole story. But children really do um, learn um, um, through their play to work out their own themes. This um, whole area of play therapy has been around for a long time. If you have not read Dibs in Search of Self, it's kind of the quintessential book or case study, I should say, of a child who who, who through play with a with a really talented um, therapist worked out all the trauma that he had been living under um, with very very strict parents who did not believe in play. So what can we do? Okay, I think we've already said a lot of things that we can do, um, but the the main thing is that we need to make time for for play, um, unstructured play, you know, true play, <laughs> Anji play. Um, at home, in the classroom, and especially outdoors, because children learn things outdoors that they cannot learn inside. And we, I, I went ahead and put a time on it, but that, that, that at a minimum, they need 60 minutes inside and 45 minutes out. I'm sure the panel can debate me on what um, minutes they would choose, but they absolutely need a lot of time because some of the time spent is uh, spent in the beginning of a play is setting the stage. Uh, I remember my own children um, in classroom, a lot of the play used to start with pretend I'm dead. <laughs> so again, children, um, you know, need to pick their own theme. But some children have a hard time playing and they want the adult to play with them. So taking on a role and really having a, you know, a play um, scenario go on, it really is the ping-ponging that Erica talked about the other day, um, the give and take of the role, that that is really going to be helpful for the child. And they need props. You all have already said all this, um, but again, here's the visual. You know, they need junk. They need stuff. Um, you know, perhaps, um, you know, uh, we're going to need some, some other, th they're going to make pretend masks to wear over their faces now. They're going to pretend they're um, on a protest. Um, so we just need to be aware that those are the themes that they need to play. And we need to give them props, of course, to, um, to help or to be there. But you know, you don't have props. Um, I remember the children in my classroom used to eat their toast um, into the shape of a gun, if that's what they wanted to play, and pow pow across the breakfast table. But this is my last slide. We, we need to be the advocates for this new paradigm. And we need um, that, that um, uh, that paradigm that will promote the unstructured play for learning and healing and the the kind of program that will allow for planning um, um, playful hands-on experiential learning activities and based on the principles of child development. So I know I talked really fast and wanted to get a lot in there, but Denisha, I'll let you take it over. Thank you so much, Marcy. I know you're doing so much there. I was like, I don't know when to break in, but you ended on a really good note because I think that new paradigm is just really sums up what we've all been talking about and it's, and it's so important. So everyone's gonna come back in and we're gonna jump right into the Q&A because I know um, Catherine's identified a lot of questions that people wanna share. And we also have some questions that we ask people ahead of time. Um, so I want to begin, and I, I'm going to take a little stab at this question because I just can't not, can't not pass it up. And I, and I know someone else put it in the chat, but we got a question about, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, right? But, um, or actually Tuesday, Wednesday, we talked about this. Um, but the, the statement says, arguments have been made to me as a teacher that children with fewer resources in their home life need the basics rather than play. How does one respond to this seemingly sympathetic approach that is this core a racist and classist argument? And in our discussion on Wednesday, and I just called it what it is, it is a racist argument. And we need to just say that, right? If, if someone's telling you uh, those children, and by those children, they typically mean black and brown and low income, don't need play, don't need hands-on experiences, don't need rich and gay experiences, what they're saying is, is racist and classist at its root. And we need to just say that and, and call them on that, right? But I think what I really wanted to focus on is it's not just those people who think that, that you know, it's, it's also parents. For me, and I know me and Keisha have talked about this, and this is what breaks my heart a lot of times in Black and Brown families, that they have been conditioned not to value play. 
Low-income families have been conditioned not to value play. They've been told their kid is at the end of this made-up gap in achievement, which is also another racist idea and classist idea, and that their kids don't need play, right? And so I think, and then you also have to deal with the fact that not, not all children can safely play. Tamir Rice was a boy who was playing and he died for that, right? And so we have to recognize that some parents, and, and, and not even to that extreme, right? But like, if you see young black children playing, are they gonna get the same response that, that young white children would get playing outside, right? So there's all these things happening, right? Where parents might not feel safe, um, but how do we encourage them to really buy into this idea of play? And for me, you know, I think if we're talking about stress, one of the great stresses that children are experiencing, children of color, is racial stress, right? And racial trauma. Right, so, so play is a way to deal with that. Play helps empower children who are dealing with a racist and classist and oppressive society to have that power and that control that they really need to flourish, right? And I think when we deny them that, then we don't give them the protection that they need to really process what's happening, right? Kids are aware of George Floyd's death, of Breonna Taylor's murder, right? Of all of these things that keep happening. And, and play is gonna be how they process that. But often we, we don't let children play in ways that they do. Like all those, all those ways you described, Marcy, right? Those are very cultural types of playing, right? But when we see children playing from a different culture, we tend to be more critical. Oh, that's not okay. Even things like war play, right? And gun play and, and roughhousing, right? We tend to discriminate those as, as not the type of play that we want. So it's a really nuanced area and I'll stop now because I can keep going, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I need to say one very quick thing. We need to distinguish between play versus imitation when we think about these issues, because a lot of what people get upset about, say, with violent play is the kids imitate what they've seen on screens. They don't transform it, connect it to what they know, and make it their own quality play. They just go around imitating and karate chopping and doing the things they've seen. So in part, when I work with parents and teachers, it's helping them think about when their children are imitators, as I've discussed, how do you help them find creative ways to transform what they're doing. So that, to me, that is what one thing we all have to think about when we work with parents and with educators in terms of how do you promote play in these times when obviously childhood has changed through the, through the decades and how do we take who the children are today and help them work on what they need to through quality play and in part it's helping them with quality play. Yeah, I mean, I think in that it is imitation and that is a form of play, right? But like, how do you, do you, do you jump in and do you, you know, do you expand it and help them process it or do you just let them go, right? Like we saw um, during the 2016 election that children were playing build the wall, right? How do you respond as, a, as an early childhood teacher when you see something like that happening, when you see children? Or I could imagine in some homes, children are playing, let me put my knee on your neck and kill you, right? Because they're, they're imitating what, they, what they've seen, right? And so how do we address that? And how do we address parents' concerns that play is not valuable because they're imitating or because they're doing these things or that it's just not safe for their children? Just to very quickly, play. one thing we need to do is help parents see how to help trans form imitation into play. So when a child says he wants to step on my neck, say, oh, but you hurt me. What can you do to help me get better? And finding, you know, a rag that you can tear up to make bandages so that the child can do that or, you know, some very simple thing. But the idea of how do you, not saying you can't play that way, but how do we help kids expand it and see that play is an ongoing kind of movie, not just one slide they're stuck on. I think, um, Denise. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it helps when parents step back and watch their children play for a moment, and then they can kind of understand where the play's coming from or where it's going, oh, how it's repeated itself in order to help them pivot, like Diane's talking about. So definitely observe them, observe them, and then maybe inter interject with some other skills. Go ahead, Marcy. Well, I was going to say that some children really don't know how to play. I, I, I shouldn't say it like that because all children know how to play. But um, children that, this was my dissertation research, what I found was that children who were heavy viewers of, uh, of screens, <laughs> and believe me, there were fewer screens back when I did my research than there are now, but children who were heavy viewers tended to just play the themes that they saw from the screens. And they also um, played 
a, a much shorter um, theme, a much shorter time period than children who were less frequent viewers. And children who were um, um, heavy viewers were not chosen to be play partners. So again, it's it's really um, interesting that um, you know Diane that that um, media can affect the play, um, and one of the the things that you can do is to team up a um, um, a, a child that needs, if you will, help um, with a star player, and they get the playing together with the star player and the. Right. That needs the help. Um, so the theme is extended and it's just not, you know, like, you know, uh, five minutes and it's over, um, that they can keep the theme going so that they can work out these emotions. I'd like to just push back a little bit against this idea of redirecting children's play, intervening with their own language around children's play, or even choosing who children should be playing with. I think a really big point of reflection in creating environments is what kind of materials you're providing what kind of consistency you're providing. Um, so I think, you know, in China and the programs we work with that serve many children who are often sort of last in line for these experiences, that when they're, it's explicitly known to them, they have an hour and a half, two hours they're playing, they have rich, engaging materials. It's okay if they sit there for 20 minutes and watch the other kids and wait to see where their moment is, where their efficacy and their autonomy is to decide how and when to play. When children are imitating things they've seen on the screens, we can listen. I can listen to a half hour. I can listen to 45 minutes of a child acting out a television scenario. And then when you go in and you give space inside the classroom for the child to then tell the story of what was going on, for other children to provide their view of what's taking place, that again, I think we want to, I think what you're saying is so critical that play is about working through so much that's going on in a child's life. And so they're telling us something. They're, they're telling us, you know, what's happening in their lives. I think the really big challenge right now, especially, is like when you have just one child um, and, and their dependence either on adults to provide that, that, that interaction or that feedback, um, their reliance on things like screens and other like high stimulus creating, like high sort of dopamine creating, dependence forming technologies or scenarios that there is kind of a tough transition and pulling away from that. A lot of that, again, is how do you provide the materials and the environments to support that? Um, and I don't want to say that that's an absolute. I, I don't want to say that we, there isn't a role for adults to play in, in, some, in some instances, you know, interacting with a child. I think to also touch sort of on Denisha's question of equity, you know, something Ms. Chung says is, you know, every child should have the best thing. Like there's no reason that every child shouldn't have the best thing. There's nothing about a child that says they shouldn't have the best thing. You know, my colleague and Christina and I, Christina and I were working with a child who, ha who was both blind and was on the spectrum. And, you know, we were, in, we were working with a program and we stepped back and we gave her an hour, an hour and a half to interact with these materials. And we took her mom aside and we said, look at this incredible hypothesis generation your child is doing. Look at her, look at how her sort of motor stereotypies, you know, her, her hand flapping is her expressing, her testing a hypothesis. And so she saw the capacity of her child. So I think in some sense, pushing through these parental notions or traditional notions of my child is gonna be left behind. They need to be smarter saying, look, I'm show, look, look how brilliant your child is and showing them an actual example of their brilliance. You can also, I think, you know, one of the things you can do is, is leverage things like Google hiring managers don't want STEM skills. They want people that are solving problems. I mean, what is the convincing data? Like what are the, what are the, what are the, what are the authorities in a community or the authorities in the wider society that justify the claim that you're making if just the experience of seeing their child's ability and your capacity to contextualize it doesn't quite do it. Um, you know. I'd, I'd like to just uh, add to kind of what Jesse is saying. I, you know, I, I think the reason we keep getting back to why adults need to intervene in children's play or play with children and that kind of thing is because we are raising our children in what from an evolutionary point of view is a very abnormal world. We're raising them in a world of isolated nuclear families where they're home with, a, with not a lot of siblings. They're not allowed neighborhood play. They're not allowed to just go out and play with the kids of the neighborhood as they once were when I was a kid. 
And then they go to age segregated classrooms where they maybe have recess. <laughs> You know, David Lancey, who's probably the expert on children throughout the world and, and non, in other cultures, says this idea that adults should play with children, this is a strange idea in most cultures. Why would you want to play with children? Children have lots of other children to play with. <laughs> and so the, uh, and, and they do, and they're playing in age mixed groups. And if some kid is, doesn't know how to play, there's older kids who scaffold them into it. And if there's older kids who don't know how to play, there's younger kids who energize them into playing. You know, one of the things I observe when I observe at the Sudbury Valley School where there are kids from age four to teenage years is they all help each other play. There'll be teenagers who come and don't know how to play. They're cynical, they're, but you know, there, there's a four-year-old who wants a piggyback ride. <laughs> Pretty soon that older kid is playing or there's a couple of little kids who are in a fight. They, They've gotten into a fight. They don't, know, they don't know how to resolve the play. So an eight-year-old comes over and solves it for them. This is very natural. This has happened throughout history with children. But we persist in thinking that there are two different social kinds of uh, uh, opportunities for children. One is with adults, and one with is, is with people who are your own age. <laughs> That's a very abnormal world. Neither of those groups are the best playmates. You want to play with older and younger kids. Those are the best playmates. Those are the playmates children have always had throughout the history of the world until we started segregating children, children by age in school. We need to get back to that. And then we will see that we adults don't have to worry about play. <laughs> kids play. <laughs> they know how to play. It's not just segregating children in school. It's also they don't go outside anymore because parents are worried it's not safe. Exactly. So, I mean, there are many, many factors that mean that children aren't getting those wonderful experiences you're describing, Peter. And there's also a lot of pressure well, that, that parents can't just let children be anymore, right? You can't, like, you have to be all controlling their lives. You have to be scheduling them and planning activities and things for them that, you, that you're not a good parent if you're not taking the lead and, and, and developing those experiences. Mm -hmm. I want to chime in real quick and say that in some cases, it is actually not safe to go outside. So I think going back to the idea of um, this change as a looking at it from a community there has to be some much larger social work happening so that we can then give the kids what Peter's saying they need. You know, there are communities where this, it can't happen in that way. Um, an example I have, so I grew up, I tell this, I'll, I'll make it quick. I know we're running out of time, but I grew up in a, in a it's kind of like a suburb, cross between a city and a suburb neighborhood, not, not very well off, pretty much poor. And um, I, but as a child, I felt rich. We had a forest, we had a creek, we had playgrounds, ample time to play, not many adults around us messing with us. It was a magical childhood. Fast forward, I had my own child. He was about 10 years old and I said to him, as I had this place in my heart for this place and I wanted to take him there. And I remember being so excited to take him to my old neighborhood and show him where I grew up. And I went back and so, the, there was a black metal fence that looked like a prison blocking the between the neighborhood and the forest. It wrapped all the way around the back of the neighborhood and blocked between the neighborhood and the creek. So all of those things, I didn't see one child outside, not one child. I mean, we had, I'm sure there were 50 kids outside at any given minute. We had community members. We knew we were being watched by somebody's mother, somebody's grandmother, but that's not happening now. Communities aren't being designed for that type of open-ended play. Mind you, we definitely got in trouble for the dig in the dumpster kind of play that we used to do, but we did it, you know, we did it for nine good years. And that's just not, um, as a society and as communities, we need to design communities with authentic childhood in mind, not these these playgrounds that are like sculptures, you know, we need authentic spaces for children to play. Yeah, and I would say some communities have those and some don't, and we know that that's intentional about which communities get access to that and which communities there, don't. Yes. There's also the whole danger, danger everywhere, raising children in a culture of fear that's perpetrated constantly so that it's, it's very hard for parents to feel like, oh, I can let my child go safely out. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a real problem. 
Right. Yeah, so I know I'm looking at the time and I know we're at time, but if you're willing to stay on, we do have a lot of questions. I know some people have to leave. We are recording it. So if you're if you're willing to stay on and continue the conversation for a little bit, I don't know if I hope that's okay with our our uh, the Jiro Studios folks. Um, but we'd love to keep talking because this is our last day and we just have a, we have some really good questions that we can't pass by. Sound good? Mm -hmm. I, I just want to and I'm gonna keep saying this because I think there are times when it is imagined fear, where um, children aren't being abducted any more than they were before. We do just have internet access, so we see it over and over again. But then there are communities where this is real. You can be shot when you go outside, you, and it happens, and it's, it's real. So I think that there are, there are two things, and we need to make sure that we are, we are um, molding our work in a way that, that discusses both yeah I, absolutely. I, I know i know um my husband and i talk about it a lot he grew up in a very different community than i did I, my community was a little safe his community was not very safe so we talk a lot about he played though he, he got to play but we talk a lot about the real um fears that parents have there and more so now so how do we support those families um, how do we support those communities and making their community safe place for their children to play? Because like you said before, all children need what's right. I think Jesse said, all children need what we know is right. So we have to do the work to make sure that we have communities for these children to live in that, that they can get what's right. Whether that be special programs. I know that um, Courtney Gardner has a program in Baltimore that is specifically a place where children can come play. And, and it kind of, it creates that, that's that safe um, that they may not have right in their own neighborhood. So I think it's important to, to focus on uh, or support programs that are doing that type of work as well. And, Absolutely. You know, think, All right, let's get the first question. We'll keep this conversation going. But Catherine, if you want to start with your first question so that we can you know keep everyone. Sure. So the first one actually comes from one of our panelists yesterday, Maureen. She says, she wants to know the panelists' suggestions on bringing the need for play into the discussion about suspension rates for black and brown children. Young learners don't have the opportunity to play in the early years, and they are subjected to rigor, scripted, colonized curriculum. The need for play needs to be part of that conversation. What I often see is that the conversations focus mostly on restorative practice, but it seems like if children were allowed to play and develop their brains the way they should be, it would be much more preventative. And that actually gets into some questions about social emotional learning that, that we've received. Yeah, that's a great question. I just want to, I do want to point out one of my observations when I was in Anji, right? I, I go in a lot. I, I observe student teachers and I have to go in and watch them teach. And typically if, I, I watch circle time and circle time is, you know, it starts off with everyone sitting and within 30 seconds, you've got stop poking me, stop touching me, you know, and you see the kids engaging in all these, you know, pretty normal behaviors when you try and force a group of young children to sit still for a long time. So in Anji, we, they play outside for two hours or so, and then they go inside and we got to watch them do what they call the, the play stories, play sharing. And what I was, and I didn't know what was happening because at the conference, you didn't have your own interpreter. You will get an interpreter if you do a study tour. So, in the, so we just sat in the room and just watched, right? It's children sitting in a, in a line of chairs, talking with a teacher. And so I just observed their behavior. And not once did I see any of the typical behaviors, the poking, the don't touch me, the move over, the teacher, I need help, the you're, the, you're in my space, the, the zoning out, the looking over here, the move, none of that, because they had spent two hours engaged in so much play that they were fine to just sit there and now talk engaged about their play for 40, 45 minutes. Even the children who weren't talking were very engaged. So we know that play is going to decrease challenging behaviors that we tend to see because these challenging behaviors come from scripted colonized curriculums that don't give children the freedom to think and the freedom to be and the freedom to explore, right? And if we just, you know, let them play, we'll see a lot of that decrease right because it just it was just yeah i think i don't know who else was there if jesse wants to talk about that but it was just yeah. amazing like it was really i mean i think i think something that's really important to bring up is that if you say to a child what you're doing with your body in space moving in the ways that you need to move in big ways all over the place is the most important thing you're going to do today and i want to understand that and i want to see that and then i want to hear what you have to say about that 
And I want you to tell me what's going on there in your own language. I want you to write your own story of your own experience. And my orientation of a teacher is to listen to that, to see you as incredibly capable and what you're doing is important. My job's not to redirect you. My job is not to get involved in your conflict. My job is not to intervene for social emotional reasons to say, oh, can you use your words to tell them what you're feeling? Not putting the teacher in the position of being a judge, of adjudicating the rightness or wrongness. Once you remove that job of adjudicating, you can interrupt a lot of the biases that come into that process of adjudicating, where one child's behavior appears worse than another's because your job is to somehow intervene. So when you take away that intervention and then when you communicate to children that what you're doing, I wanna understand, then you're removing a power dynamic around certain behaviors are good, certain behaviors are bad, which always becomes certain behaviors of certain children are good and certain behaviors of certain children are bad. And that always comes back to, well, I didn't see it, so I wanna hear what the children have to say about it. And then you're making decisions about who's right and who's wrong. And that puts you in a really bad position vis-a-vis -vis the children's trust of you. Because, you know, ju justice is not blind. Um, and it's not, you know, and so when your whole orientation is to the child's being and that being the best thing, and then in the classroom, the child's listening is about hearing other children speak, then even if a child does move around and poke, that's fine, that's what children do. Children poke each other, they pull each other's hair. They, they argue with each other, they squabble, that's just, and the more a teacher is looking at children, the more they realize that's just a completely normal, natural thing. But I think also, if they're getting their energy out, if they're getting their experiences out, they get in class, they wanna to listen to each other, they wanna to talk to each other. Anyone else? Okay, I'd like to move on to another question. It's, it's somewhat related. Um, there was a discussion around unschooling wondering how we can get public schools to embrace that concept since we know children's learning is often inhibited once they enter the system of schooling. There is certain amount of trauma for many children that is tied directly to the requirements of schooling. And I'm actually going to leave that open for anyone to answer that one. I'd like to just take a quick stab. Um, I said it earlier and other um, have said it um, through the, the days here. We need to base education on child development. I mean, what we know about how children learn and grow. And again, um, we need a whole new paradigm. I think the paradigm we have right now can't be fixed. I think we need, that's my opinion. I think that we need to, to start fresh. And, um, you know, I, I love the things Peter said about multi-age grouping. Um, my husband actually student taught in um, a school. The name of the school was called Discovery School. And kindergarten through third grade were all in the same room. And out back of the school was a big woods. And they went back there and they built forts. They, you know, lashed um, twigs together to make tables. You know, they were doing, and again, the older children, the we're teaching the younger children and the younger children were learning from the older children. But we need a whole new paradigm. I, I, don't, I don't think we can fix what we have right now. One thing I need to say is I studied the cycles of education throughout history. And during more conservative times, schools are more repressive and rote. And during more progressive times, schools are more, more child-centered and individualized. And I, that was a major part of my doctorate. And and it, you know, I looked at it throughout for many decades and uh, centuries, and that's what's happening. I mean, in part, that's what we're going through right now. And thinking about how what's happening is not just in isolation, it's really connected to all kinds of forces in society right now. That I would expect some of the some of you and some of the listeners are concerned about, and so thinking about how what we're talking about fits into a broader context can often be helpful. And that's a good point, Diane. I'm getting ready to teach uh, foundation, Foundations of Education this summer. And so we look at you know, historical, social, political, and philosophical aspects of schooling. And when you look at the historical aspects, you know, this, this push for efficiency really is what got us these, these urban school centers, right? We had all of these small villages and, and one-room schoolhouses, right? And, but you also think about the people who come in and then change things and why they're changing it, right? And really understand what, what their impulse is and, and why they're doing that. Because I think you're robots, right. efficiencies is that easy. Yes. 
creating robots, yeah. But it was also about consolidating the power, right? These were graduates of elite colleges who wanted a system that they could control. And they said, we should be controlling public education. We graduated from Harvard. And, but they knew nothing about education and children and teaching, right? But it was this idea that they were the ones who should come over, come in and, and, and make decisions and, and create this superintendent in this administration that knew better than what the teachers did and what the parents did and what the community did. And now we're seeing, you know, um, this one best system, as David Tyatt calls it, right, that it doesn't work in a pandemic, right? This, this model of efficiency is actually not good in a pandemic where we can't go back to the, you know, putting as many kids into school buildings as possible based on where they live geographically, which is not how education was always done, right? It's just how education became. There's a new wave. There's a new wave called micro school. Um, I don't know if it's new, but it's new to me. Micro schools where it's kind of re rewinding back to the idea of much smaller um, school environments only because, like you said, we can't get as many children in classrooms as we did before, which wasn't go a good thing in the first place. So thanks, COVID. There's a follow-up question that says, that they, how, do we get, how do we get this, how do we get that through to, the, to those who make the decisions to the system? And I know Jesse wants to jump in, but really quick, I also, in that vein, right, there is no one best system. So we can't think that unschooling is not for everybody. I'm sorry, if you think uh, you're going to just replace the system we have with your version of what's right, you're missing the whole idea. I want, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't like the way the choice movement is, is done, but I do want real choice. And real choice says, I want my child to have an unschooling experience, and I should get that, and that should be part of the public education option, right? But we can't think that we can, it's not for everyone, right? So we do need policies that allow parents and communities to create these things, but knowing that it's not going to be, it's not everybody's going to want this for their children. And I think that's, you know, some of the stuff we've discussed about with Angie Play and True Play, right? We need to put it out there and say, this is what we think is great. And, and you should have access to this if you want it, but also recognize that not everybody's going to want it for, for a lot of reasons. Well, and I think so much of what drives that decision making is not just this neoliberal push for efficiency, but, you know, also these perceptions of scarcity amongst parents. I mean, a lot of that scarcity is generated by these systems to, to force compliance. But if I'm afraid that my child, you know, in the, in the 60s, it might be more likely that you think your child is definitely going to have it better than you did when you were a kid. You know, as a parent now, a five and a half year old and a three month old, you know, I don't know if that's the case. So I'm going to be much more concerned about efficiently getting my child into that system that's been generated by these powerful interests so that they can be get one up on some other child. So there's that competitive scarcity, like that false sense of scarcity around resources. I mean, I think what you're saying, Denisha, what Keisha is saying is like, you create models. And I mean, you sh at our best, we create models that are equitable, that everyone has access to. For us, we're starting with the children that are oftentimes least, having least, the least amount of access to that. But you know, revolution can come from saying, I'm just gonna do it differently. I'm gonna do it differently. If it works for you, come join me. If you see it and that makes sense, then you do it too. And I, we're gonna work together to make that happen. I mean, we, we, you know, and I think this is what Defending the Earliers is doing, right? It's, it's advocating, but it's also creating, creating space for people to do what's right um, and fighting, like just fight, you know, fighting and building, fighting and building. So to, to pivot off of that, um, there's a couple questions around in, uh, bringing in parents into the equation and bringing in parents um, as advocates for play and to educate the parents and to help them advocate. Um, there, there is a question here that really expands on that, which is, I would like to hear the panelists on ideas on how to express this to parents and policy, and policymakers, and how do we do this without parents and others thinking that lower income children will fall further behind when they believe they need to be, to have more push with academics. Sure, go ahead, Murphy. I'm, gonna, I'm leaving this open to the whole group because everyone is an expert on that. So I just wanna say, I, I just wanna say one thing. Um, one of the things that, uh, other than play that I'm very interested in is literacy development. And what we have happening in our schools right now is that children, um, some, not all, are learning how to read, but they can't comprehend. Um, and, and this goes back to that left brain, right brain, and the, the right brain being, you know, uh, developed during play and, and, um, and 
the notion that to really understand, you have to have this worldly understanding that you learn through play. And so again, um, you know, the, the model of what we're doing right now based on test, um, you know, I worked for a couple of the big test publishing companies and it's, that's what's driving curriculum. It's account, it's what they call accountability. It's, and so what's happening with literacy, let me just finish this example and then I'll, I'll let others speak. But what's happening is children are doing, if some children, again, I always have to say some children are doing, you know, well on passing the test in kindergarten, first, second grade. But in third grade, the test um, changes from testing how to read to what you're reading. And they can't make that transition because they just never really learn how to read which the, pro, or the definition of reading is processing print to get meaning. And if they're not getting any meaning, they're just sounding out words. Um, that's, that's, like I said, this is what's wrong with, in my opinion, part of what's wrong with education. And play, per, play actually helps them be better readers because they, they learn how to use symbols. You know, symbolic play um, leads to decoding symbols in um, literacy later. So I, I, again, um, we, we just really have, can't allow the testing companies and the legislators to say what's good for children. So that's and I think for parents, I mean, we just have to, we have to encourage them and let them know that, you know, this is the best, most equitable, most affordable way for your child to develop and to, to be a strong, capable person, right? Um, and, and to help them, because it's a lot of, they're, they're getting a lot of fear. They're getting a lot of messages that their kid's going to be behind, that their kid's not going to get into Yale or get into the best high school or the best preschool. And, and, and we need to, to really give them the confidence to say, you can make this decision and we're in it with you, right? And I think folks like Keisha and Kate who work with parents, like to let them know that we are partners in this with you and we're going to see you through this journey and you're going to be okay and your child's going to come out better for it, I think is also really important. I also think that a lot of uh, parents especially are not considering the fact like Keisha brought up about these prescribed curriculums or if we're looking at the you know theme-based curriculums oftentimes it's the finite knowledge or even the scope and sequence right it's the finite knowledge that the parents that sur surface knowledge that the parents see you know are they multiplying are they regressing are they you know being able to decode words and not realizing that that curriculum or that surface knowledge does not necessarily indicate deep understanding of the concepts, right? And so this regression may not be necessarily a testament to the fact that they're not in school. It may be more of a testament to the fact that they never deeply understood these concepts to begin with, right? And so the I think communicating that to families too is, is a way to help people understand that while yes, schools are very important and there's a lot of good things that can come out of them, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child has a depth of learning because they're in this formal school setting versus being at home. Great. Go ahead, one more. <laughs> do we have time for one more? Should we, or I'll leave it to the panel. <laughs> do we have time for one more? Sure. <laughs> okay. One more in two minutes and then we'll be okay. done. There's All still right. a lot of people here. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So okay, so there is um a question here. There's a big emphasis on social emotional learning, which is a packaged product in many large school large city schools. <laughs> My question is how do you promote the idea in play? That play in this situation, and the second question is the push down of skills in an early childhood is causing stress and, and the emotional tra tra difficulties. There's two very quick things I want to say is one is um, helping parents, um, well, helping anyone see that play is learning and how is it learning? How is when kids build with blocks teaching, you know, stacking blocks teaching math? How is when kids, um, you know, use a paintbrush and start working out the different colors. Is that contributing to understanding two-dimensional space that will contribute to literacy? I mean, it's not always, I mean, it's not always obvious and to say, teaching the play course that I do, I have, you know, students have to observe, do a play observation and, and, and do a paper on how they would show what, what the child is learning from that play to some adult 
who was concerned that the child was, was playing, you know, and not, not learning, you know, to really help them develop those skills. I think, you know, to Marthy's point about literacy, right? You know, I always ask my mom, you know, I'm a, for one, I, I love to read. Like when we're done, I, I might listen to an audio book that I've listened to a dozen times. Like I reread my favorite stories, right? And, and my mom said, it, of all her children, I just naturally wanted to learn to read. I would stare at the newspaper and try and figure it out when I was four, I thought I could do it on my own. But what I've noticed now is that, you know, other children, they're, because they're being taught to read, they're never developing the, the desire to want to read. And I think this came up in a play and power discussion, Keisha, when you were talking about how, you know, children on their own, when they're ready, will go get a piece of paper and will write something when they're ready, not because you sat them down and told them to write what's on the board. When they want to read, when they need these skills, they will come to you and say, will you read this book to me, right? And that's what's missing. If we don't, if you don't want to do it for some reason, then you're, are you ever going to become a true lover of it? And, and yes, I might have wanted to do it when I was four, but what if I didn't want to do it till I was 10? That should be okay, right? As long as at some point I want to do it for myself, nothing can replace that, right? But instead we force children, we tell them they have to be readers and they have to learn to read. And we get a bunch of kids who know how to read, but don't like it. And, we'll, and when I hear people say, I've never read a book since high school, it breaks my heart because you never ever was given that space to love to read, to want to, to learn to read for yourself, not because somebody else was doing it for you. Some of my main issues with um, literacy in schools or, or the reading in schools is the bribery, the trickery, the required reading, the hear this, you have to read this text, as opposed to um, starting from a young age and just having literacy, literature, books in your environment and accessible, writing tools and materials, all different kinds of writing tools and materials in your environment and accessible. And I think that's why um, children who are immersed in that, it's not separated from their play, right? It's a part of it. We do not separate learning from play. That's the first mistake that is made in schools. When you separate that, you're telling a child and you're telling a family and you're telling a community and you're telling, you know, a people that those are two separate things when in fact they're not. So it's, I think it's both stifling academic structured learning and it's stifling play. There's so much stronger, you know, it's so much stronger as a unit. And, and, and I think that it, it, just to, 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 add on to that, that like when children have those incredibly meaningful experiences of play, then they have something to talk about. They have stories to tell. Um, if every day they have a chance to draw a picture of what they did and somebody writes down their words, if they're always engaged in a process of, of being heard and hearing and articulating their experience, I mean, that's such a critical aspect of reading, right? The metaphor, the comparison, the, the hyperbole, the, um, the themes, the images that emerge, and the ability to describe and organize that in their thoughts. I mean, that that is deep, like that's deep reading, right? Yeah. And so and they're going to learn that, how to use symbols when they need to, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing that their thoughts and ideas can then be transferred through language onto a piece of paper. Like, I, I, I remember I was, um, you know, a document and, and watch the children and sometimes I'm writing and one of the kids came over to me with a clipboard and a piece of paper and he sat by me with a pen and he watched me and he, and he said, what are you doing? I want to do what you're doing. I said, well, I'm watching you guys play and I'm writing what I see. He said, well, what do you see? So that was the first time that he, and I had him too, it was the first time he had ever came to me with an interest in winning. He genuinely wanted to write these these symbols I had on my paper and he wanted to know what they were called. And that was the start of his interest. And what's sad is this child, it was so right in every way. And then he went to the school system and, and began getting a message that he wasn't smart enough because he hadn't mastered all these things that they deemed that he should master. So that's the, the first issue. You're, you're taking a child who has this self positive self image. And even if you're not directly saying it to them, they begin to start to think that there's something wrong with themselves. They're not meeting that, that marker that's not based on, on anything developmental. And you just gave the perfect example of how everything, children learn in totally unique ways. Mm -hmm. And to assume everyone's going to learn in the same way, you know, to, to give that kind of room for diversity and support it and have kids see from each other how they're doing it. I mean, that kind of individualized learning is so valuable but so rare these days mm -hmm. well and not All to right. mention oh go ahead 
Sorry, I was going to say, not to mention the fact that intrinsic motivation being the greatest motivator for learning, like you're saying, Denisha, if we left space for this intrinsic motivation to learn how to read when you're 10 without shaming children before they get to kindergarten about not knowing how to do it, then there's space for that. But if they're already out of the ability to enjoy that process after the age of five, then there's so much loss there. Wow. All right, guys, I think we're going to wrap it up, but we're never going to end this conversation. Oh, my goodness. I'm so delighted. I want to so say delighted. thank you thank to you. Peter Gray, Jesse Cofino, Kate Woodford, Keisha Reed, Marcy Gademi, Diane Levin, Diane. Nancy Carlson Page, Blakely Bundy, Nancy Rutherford, Catherine Fig, Jiro, and Felicia, and everyone who's just made this just amazing four days just so much to thank you defending the earliers everyone who's been on a panel for the past three days thank you so much